update to you all, family. I, I want you to know that I've greatly missed you. It's been such a hard season for all of us on so many different levels. It was really hard not being able to gather, but by God's grace, here we are again. And I want to thank you all in advance for staying in your cars to make sure that we can continue to use this facility and make sure that we do all we can to not spread the stupid virus that has impacted so many of us and it's affected some of our own families, including my own. But God in his mercy has us healthy, spiritually wealthy, and strengthened to follow him no matter what else comes our way. Amen? Amen. Now today we begin to look at Advent, the coming of our Lord Jesus. And everybody likes to remember his first coming, right? We even made up a whole season called Christmas in which neighborhoods will decorate homes and, and gardens and trees and offices and, and the mall and everything gets tinsels, lights, and some bling bling sparkle, right? We set up trees and we exchange gifts and we gather and we break bread and man, can we break bread, right? Amen. Now, traditionally, Mexicans, we participate in something called posadas, right? Las posadas are a tradition celebrated in Mexico, and the word posada means inn. And it recounts the story of Joseph and Mary looking for an inn throughout the neighborhood. It involves eating buñuelos, these crispy flour tortillas with like cinnamon and brown sugar and syrup and like, I gotta stop talking because I gotta finish my sermon. I'm already getting like saliva in my mouth. But um, it, it involves eating buñuelos and drinking atole and ponche while celebrating with friends and family. And sometimes we'll even have a piñata that represents the worldly enticements, right? And the stick that we break it with represents Christianity. Now back in the day, priests would normally take the opportunity to instruct people in Christianity. Celebrating family is great. But more important is to taking the time to instruct our loved ones of the Christ who came and will come again. Amen? And that's what we'll do today, instruct you, our loved ones, about the Christ who came and will come again. And I pray that for a moment, we can put the posadas, the ponche, the atole, put all that to the side and out of our thoughts as we focus on something much more important. The proclamation of the Lord's second coming. The proclamation of the Lord's next coming. Because when he comes back, let me tell you, it's, it's going to be a wrap. It's going to be over. No more chances, no more doers. It's a done data. It's over. The fat lady will have sang. It's going to be game for unbelievers. But for us, it will be beautiful. I mean, we look toward the advent of Christ without fear and promiscuously share his gospel. Amen? I was talking to one of my homies this past week, Pastor Jordan Hall of Trinity Church up in San Francisco, and he shared something with me that I want to share with you today as we focus on Advent. He sent me an image with two scriptures, and the first is in the Old Testament when, when David asked this question, he said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? And in the New Testament, it was Elizabeth visiting uh, Mary, Elizabeth, the mother of John, she went to go visit pregnant Mary, and she asked, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And when I saw it, I was like, this is deep. I sat there thinking of how profound these, these two scriptures are right next to each other. In the Old Testament, the presence of the Lord was tucked away in a box. While in the New Testament, the presence of the Lord was tucked away in Mary's womb, about to be delivered to us in person. And my goal today is to remind you that he will come again in a very real and a very tangible way. One that will change everything as we know it. Please open up your Bibles to the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 13. The Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 13. We'll be reading four short verses from verse 24 through 27. Let me get a quick beep or a honk when you're there. Amen. And the word of God reads as follows from Mark 13, 24 through 10, 27. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will be falling from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. People of God, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Please remain in your cars, friends. Now, some of you might be asking, why are we starting off with what sounds like doom and gloom, right? Like, like tribulation, a, a darkened sun, the moon and the sun not shedding light. Wait, what you mean the stars are going to fall from the sky? Like for reals, for reals? And my answer is this. What do you think? God's not playing around. He's telling us what's going to happen when he comes back. This isn't a joke. This isn't a time for fun and games. What we're talking about today has eternal consequences. Y'all know how long eternal is? That's a very long time. Now, I don't know how much attention, although I hope it's a lot, I don't know how much attention you pay to when we recite the Apostles' Creed together, but there's one piece that we always enunciate a bit stronger. When we're confessing our belief in Jesus, we say this, He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. Every Sunday, for some reason or another, we never, Pastor Chris, Steve, myself, we never like said, hey, when we get to this part, we're going to enunciate stronger. But it's a fact. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Why do you think that we enunciate that part so strong? It's because we want to remind you that Christ will come again. And when he does, that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to come to judge us for what we've said and what we've done, and he will seek payment. Now, there's a few things I want to mention today as we break this down. And the first is this. When Christ comes again, it will be cataclysmic. And the second is that when Christ comes again, it will not be a secret. But for us as people, it's okay, because the third point is that when Christ comes again, he will gather his people, you and I. It's one of the first point, verses 24 through 25. When Christ comes again, it will be cataclysmic. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will be falling from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Now that seems pretty scary, right? It's, it's not going to be a pretty scene at all from what we could read here. Listen again, it says that the sun and the moon will be darkened. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavens will be shaken. But we won't. Our faith won't. For those of us that are placed our faith in the resurrected Jesus, the Jesus who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, the Jesus that was born of the Virgin Mary, that suffered under Pontius Pilate, that was crucified, died, and was buried, the one that descended to the dead on the third day he rose again and is now seated at the right hand of the Father where he will, where he will reign forever and ever along with him in the Holy Spirit. If we believe in that Jesus, we will be saved. We won't look upon this time with fear, instead with expectation. It will be a time for joy, a time for celebration, a time of relief when we know that the troubles of this world, the ills of this world, the disease and the affliction our sick and broken bodies, our anxieties and our fears, our depression, it'll all be over. Revelation 21, 4, 21 4 says that, that he will wipe every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the, the former things have passed away. So when we hear about some of these scary cataclysmic events, we won't be scared. Because we know that it's our Lord coming back. Listen to what 2 Peter 3.10 says. But when the day of God's judgment does come, it will be unannounced like a thief. The sky will collapse with a thunderous bang, everything disintegrating in a huge conflagration. Earth and all its works exposed to the scrutiny of judgment. An early church father said that, that this will be such an event that the true light will make the other stars seem, other stars seem dark. Listen to what his, his words said. He said, the stars at the day of judgment will seem to be dark. 
not by any failure of their own luster, but in consequence of the increase of the true light throwing them into shame. The Lord Jesus will far outshine even the brightest stars, like, like nothing ever seen. When the Lord Jesus invades the earth again, this time it will be in judgment. We won't fear, we shouldn't fear. Instead, we'll rejoice knowing that he has come for us. And this won't be hushed. This brings me to my second point, that when Christ comes again, it will not be a secret. It will be many things, but being kept on the down low won't be one of them. Listen to what verse 26 says. When they will see, then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. When he comes, it's going to come like a thief in the night. But the event itself will not be secret. Can I share a true story with you? Can I be just a little bit transparent? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give, I'm going to give you some ammunition and some material to make fun of me, okay? When I was a new Christian in prison, I hadn't studied much theology. So I kind of went along with, with the Hollywood version of what it's going to look like when Christ returns. I'm guilty. I was hooked on the Left Behind series whose the main idea was the rapture, right? I know, don't laugh, don't laugh. Yes, I believe in the rapture. But now, now that I've studied the Bible, I know what dispensational theology is and how horribly wrong it is, amen? But I do remember reading those books over and over. And I always got stuck on the portion that talked about the Antichrist and how he would come and deceive everybody how he'd secretly work his way up into power and get and people get suckered into following him in and then bam they were deceived and they were lost forever and ever i used to stress so much over christ's second coming worried that i would follow the wrong christ that i would actually follow the antichrist and i wouldn't know how to differentiate the bootleg jesus from the real jesus and i don't want to go to hell man like i love the lord I really love him. And I wanted to stay true to him, not some bootleg version. I didn't want to get suckered in and serve the wrong Christ. And so when I see scriptures like today's that reads that the people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and when I read scripture like Acts 1.11 that says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him going to heaven. It assures us that when Christ comes back, it will be cataclysmic. It won't be a secret. No one is going to sneak up on you and deceive you. We can't be lost. Our salvation is secure in Christ. And no one or nothing can snatch us from his hand. Amen? But don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. John 10, 27-30. The Lord Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Fam, we are blood bought. And his promises will all be fulfilled at this time, both to believers and unbelievers. All of us will be judged, will all be convicted, but for Christ's followers, our debt has been paid. And for those that have rejected him, well, that's quite a different story. But please know that we, we, his people, will be safe. Which brings me to my third and final point. When Christ comes again, he will gather his people. Verse 27 says that he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Be at peace knowing that in this public cataclysmic event when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead, to pass judgment on everyone and everything, before this happens, he's going to take care of us. Wherever we are, no matter what part of the world we're at, if we're still alive, he's going to gather us before he enacts punishment. He always has and always will look out for his people. The safety of his people is a concern of his. 
He's demonstrated in the past, and he will continue to do so in the future. Remember Noah? The world had gone off its rails, full of corruption. Mankind was corrupt, and God was about to wipe out the entire world with the flood. But before he did, he made sure that Noah and his family were safe on the ark. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? The fire and brimstone did not fall until his people were safe. The safety of the Lord's people is a concern of his. We're going to be okay. He will gather us from wherever we are when judgment falls upon the earth. And let me remind you why this is such a big deal. Let me remind you why this is such a big deal. I'm going to use the words of J.C. Ryle to help us be mindful that Christ's second coming will be nothing like his first. Nothing like his first. Listen to what he says. The second coming of Christ shall be utterly unlike the first. He came the first time in weakness, a tender infant born of a woman in the manger at Bethlehem, unnoticed, unhonored, and scarcely known. He shall come the second time in royal dignity with the armies of heaven around him to be known, recognized, and feared by all the tribes of the earth. He came the first time to suffer, to bear our sin, to be reckoned a curse, to be despised, rejected, rejected unjustly, condemned, and slain. He shall come the second time to reign, to put down every enemy beneath his feet, to take the kingdoms of this world for his inheritance, to rule them with righteousness, to judge all men, and to live forevermore. Can y'all see why this is so important? It's not gonna be the same as the first time he came. There's not gonna be some cute baby swallowed in a manger with shepherds and, and, and wise men coming to visit. There's not gonna be a soft-spoken man who was being beaten, humiliated, and spit on. That's a wrap, it's over. No mas. Christ is coming as judge. Can you see the dire urgency to let folks know that this is gonna happen? We need to let our folks know, to tell the world that they might know that he's coming again, that they too would hear the gospel and believe. Friends, can you see why it's imperative that we do everything we can to tell people this glorious story and that they too would understand and believe? So if you want to decorate the house up, go for it. If you want to put up a tree, go for it. Exchange gifts, that's cool. But don't you dare pass up the opportunity to tell people what this time is really about. Don't you dare not speak up on an opportunity to tell people exactly what the reason for this season is. Make sure to tell them that it's not about Santa Claus. Cover your kids' ears up if you don't want them to hear this. It's not about some jolly old fat white dude in a red suit flying around on a magical reindeer dropping off presents to good kids and that the naughty ones are getting nothing. No, instead tell them about a mighty king who humbled himself as a servant to the point of death, even death on a cross. For the sake of all the naughty kids who really don't deserve nothing. But this king, he is merciful and gave the naughty kids a chance to believe in and trust in him and in him alone. Make sure to tell these folks that in reality there are no good, no good kids making us all naughty. And they don't want to get what they deserve. And they don't have to get what they deserve. Because Christ has already taken it all. If only they believe. You feel me? This is the message we believe. This is the message that we must proclaim. As good as he's been to us, why do we not want to share him with the entire world? He's too good to keep to ourselves. Can I ask you a question? How selfish would it be of you or of me to know how sick we truly are? To know exactly what the vaccine is for our sickness and yet not tell anybody about it. How selfish is that? Imagine you someone you love is sick with COVID or cancer and they're about to die 
and you know that somebody you know knows exactly how to save them, yet never speaks up. Fam, that's how it is for us. If we know that folks are sinners, because we all are, if we know that they can be saved but choose not to tell them, that ain't love, that's hate. Ugly, selfish hatred. Let us not be guilty of that when Christ does return. So during this season that we call Christmas, let us be mindful of what really is at stake. Posadas, piñatas, and ponche, those are great things. Those are a part of our culture. Spending time with family and celebrating festivities, those are all great things. Exchanging gifts with loved ones is a great thing, right? It's always good to receive something from someone we love. Sometimes folks really go out of their way and, and they study us and they do their homework and they find the time to look and find the perfect gift for us. And when they do, it shows you how well they know us by the gift they got us, right? And at other times, more frequently, we get gift cards, right? And praise God for gift cards. Now, I don't think this is done to avoid thought or, or time to pick the right gift, but instead it gives the recipient of the gift an opportunity to get something that he or she may really want or need. But here's the great thing about our Lord and Savior. He didn't give us a gift card. He knew exactly what we needed. He loves us more than your mom or dad loves you, and he loves you more than you love your own kids. So how about we celebrate those things that are really worth celebrating? I got three points of application Three, three, three congregational challenges, if you would. And the first is this. This Advent season, remember the greatest gift exchange ever. You gave nothing and received everything. Christ exchanged his life for ours. He willingly went to die on a cross to suffer for the sake of his very enemies. People like us that would want nothing to do with him. 1 Peter 2.24 says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Now you might not know it, but this is the greatest gift given to anybody ever who didn't know or even wanted at the time because it has eternal implications. There is no expiration date on it. And the second challenge is that this Advent season, remember that God is coming back, so stay suited and booted. God is coming back, so stay suited and booted. Although this is a very specific time or season that we remember Christ coming into the world as a baby in the manger, and we preach and teach to remind folks about his second coming and judgment, don't let this be the only time of the year that we talk about it. Don't let it be the only time we talk about it. We share the gospel here every Sunday. And I try to do it every single day of my life because it matters. Because people's eternity literally depend on them hearing, knowing, and believing. May we stay suited and booted always to share the glorious gospel of Christ. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is in you. You do it with gentleness and respect. May we always be prepared. And the third challenge, family, is this. This Advent season, remember these final thoughts. For Christ's friends and for Christ's foes. For Christ's friends, we can be at peace knowing that our King will soon be here. We'll reap all that we've sown. We'll re we're we're going to receive our rewards for all that we've endured for Christ's sake. We'll exchange the cross for a crown. Gifted to us from our King himself. But for Christ's foes, they will see the one they rejected and despised. The one they conspired against. He will establish a visible superiority over them. The same Jesus whose gospel message they failed or refused to believe in will now stand before them where they will stand helpless to do anything, hopeless to change things 
and speechless with no defense as they are judged. My question to you is, when Christ comes again, he will bring both sorrow and joy. Which will you be on, sorrow or joy? Fam, this has been a really tough year and an even harder season for many of us. One of the worst ever. I pray you find comfort in knowing that one day, one day Christ will come for you and he will come for me. And you will have seen that all we have endured will have been worth it. There are too many things in this world that we can cling to and be sure that it will never betray us. There's not too many things that we can cling to and not wonder if they'll leave us hanging too. The love of Christ is one of those things that we can cling to. He'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. He's got us. He's in the boat with us as we confront life's most difficult storms. He's our peace in the midst of chaos. He's our resting place. Trust in the one who gave the greatest present at a gift exchange. But he got death and we got life. Amen? I close with a quote from St. Augustine that says this, even amid this calamity, God is restoring the brokenness of humanity, broken in Adam's fall by gathering the whole world the new humanity in Christ. If we resist his first coming, we will tremble at his second coming. Join me in a word of prayer.